Chapter Forty Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Chapter Forty Two. War. I found Clarence alone in his quarters, drowned in melancholy, and in place of the electric light. He had reinstituted the ancient rag lamp and sat there in a grisly twilight with all curtains drawn tight. He sprang up and rushed for me eagerly, saying, Oh, it's worth a billion milrays to look upon a live person again. He knew me as easily as if I hadn't been disguised at all, which frightened me, one may easily believe that. Quick now, tell me the meaning of this fearful disaster, I said. How did it come about? Well, if there hadn't been any Queen Guinevere, it wouldn't have come so early. But it would have come anyway. It would have come on our own account by and by, by luck it happened to come on the Queen's. And Sir Lancelot's? Just so. Give me the details. I reckon you will grant that during some years there has been only one pair of eyes in these kingdoms that has not been looking steadily askance at the Queen and Sir Lancelot. Yes, King Arthur's and only one heart that was without suspicion. Yes, the king's. A heart that isn't capable of thinking evil of a friend. Well, the king might have gone on, still happy and unsuspecting, to the end of his days, but for one of your modern improvements, the stock board. When you left, three miles of the London, Canterbury, and Dover were ready for the rails, and also ready and ripe for manipulation in the stock market. It was wildcat, and everybody knew it. The stock was for sale at a giveaway. What does Sir Lancelot do but— Yes, I know. He quietly picked up nearly all of it for a song. Then he bought about twice as much more, deliverable upon call. And he was about to call when I left. Very well. He did call. The boys couldn't deliver. Oh, he had them. And he just settled his grip and squeezed them. They were laughing in their sleeves over their smartness in selling stock to him at fifteen and sixteen and along there that wasn't worth ten. Well, when they had laughed long enough on that side of their mouths, they rested up that side by shifting the laugh to the other side. That was when they compromised with the invincible at two hundred and eighty-three. Good land! He skinned them alive, and they deserved it. Anyway, the whole kingdom rejoiced. Well, among the flayed were Sir Agravain and Sir Mordred, nephews to the king. End of the first act. Act second, scene first, an apartment in Carlisle Castle, where the court had gone for a few days hunting. Persons present, the whole tribe of the king's nephews. Mordred and Agravain proposed to call the guileless Arthur's attention to Guinevere and Sir Lancelot. Sir Gawain, Sir Gareth, and Sir Gaheris will have nothing to do with it. A dispute ensues with loud talk. In the midst of it, enter the king. Mordred and Agravain spring their devastating tale upon him. Tableau. A trap is laid for Lancelot by the king's command, and Sir Lancelot walks into it. He made it sufficiently uncomfortable for the ambushed witnesses to it, Mordred, Agravain, and twelve knights of lesser rank, for he killed every one of them but Mordred. But of course that couldn't straighten matters between Lancelot and the king, and didn't. Oh, dear! Only one thing could result, I see that. War! and the knights of the realm divided into a king's party and a Sir Lancelot's party. Yes, that was the way of it. The king sent the queen to the stake, proposing to purify her with fire. And Lancelot and his knights rescued her, and in doing it slew certain good old friends of yours and mine, in fact some of the best we ever had, to wit Sir Bellius le Orgulus, Sir Seguaridus, Sir Griflet le Fils de Dieu, Sir Brandolus, Sir Aglovale. Oh, you tear out my heart-strings! Wait, I'm not done yet. Sir Tor, Sir Gauter, Sir Gillimer, the very best man in my subordinate nine. What a handy right-fielder he was! Sir Reynolds' three brothers, Sir Damus, Sir Priamus, Sir Kay the stranger. My peerless shortstop! I've seen him catch a daisy-cutter in his teeth. Come, I can't stand this! Sir Driant, Sir Lambagus, Sir Hermendi, Sir Pertelope, Sir Pyramonus, and whom do you think? Rush, go on. Sir Gaheris and Sir Gareth, both. Oh, incredible! Their love for Lancelot was indestructible. Well, it was an accident. They were simply onlookers. They were unarmed, and were merely there to witness the Queen's punishment. 
Sir Lancelot smote down whoever came in the way of his blind fury, and he killed these without noticing who they were. Here is an instantaneous photograph one of our boys got of the battle. It's for sale on every newsstand. There the figures nearest the Queen are Sir Lancelot with his sword up, and Sir Gareth gasping his last breath. You can catch the agony in the Queen's face through the curling smoke. It's a rattling battle picture. Indeed it is. We must take good care of it. Its historical value is incalculable. Go on. Well, the rest of the tale is just war, pure and simple. Lancelot retreated to his town and castle of joyous guard, and gathered there a great following of knights. The king, with a great host, went there, and there was desperate fighting during several days, and, as a result, all the plain around was paved with corpses and cast-iron. Then the church patched up a peace between Arthur and Lancelot, and the queen, and everybody, everybody but Sir Gawain. He was bitter about the slaying of his brothers Gareth and Gaheris, and would not be appeased. He notified Lancelot to get him thence, and make swift preparation, and look to be soon attacked. So Lancelot sailed to his duchy of Guienne with his following, and Gawain soon followed with an army, and he beguiled Arthur to go with him. Arthur left the kingdom in Sir Mordred's hands until you should return. Ah, a king's customary wisdom! Yes, Sir Mordred set himself at once to work to make his kingship permanent. He was going to marry Guinevere as a first move, but she fled and shut herself up in the Tower of London. Mordred attacked. The Bishop of Canterbury dropped down on him with the interdict. The king returned. Mordred fought him at Dover, at Canterbury, and again at Barham Down. Then there was talk of peace and a composition. Terms, Mordred to have Cornwall and Kent during Arthur's life, and the whole kingdom afterward. Well, upon my word, my dream of a republic to be a dream, and so remain. Yes, the two armies lay near Salisbury. Gawain, Gawain's head is at Dover Castle, he fell in the fight there. Gawain appeared to Arthur in a dream, at least his ghost did, and warned him to refrain from conflict for a month, let the delay cost what it might. But battle was precipitated by an accident. Arthur had given order that if a sword was raised during the consultation over the proposed treaty with Mordred, sound the trumpet and fall on, for he had no confidence in Mordred. Mordred had given a similar order to his people. Well, by and by an adder bit a knight's heel. The knight forgot all about the order and made a slash at the adder with his sword. Inside of half a minute those two prodigious hosts came together with a crash. They butchered away all day. Then the king— uh, However, we have started something fresh since you left. Our paper has. No. What is that? War correspondence. Why, that's good. Yes, the paper was booming right along, for the interdict made no impression, got no grip, while the war lasted. I had war correspondence with both armies. I will finish that battle by reading you what one of the boys says. Then the king looked about him, and then was he ware of all his host, and all of his good knights were left no more on live but two knights, that was Sir Lucan de Butler, and his brother Sir Bedivere, and they were full sore wounded. Jesu mercy, said the king, where are all my noble knights becomen? Alas, that ever I should see this doleful day! For now, said Arthur, I am come to mine end, but would to God, I wist where were that traitor Sir Mordred, that hath cost all this mischief. Then was King Arthur ware, where Sir Mordred leaned upon his sword among a great heap of dead men. Now give me my spear, said Arthur unto Sir Lucan, for yonder I have espied the traitor that all this woe hath wrought. Sir, let him be, said Sir Lucan, for he is unhappy. If ye pass this unhappy day, ye shall be right well revenged upon him. Good Lord, remember ye of your knight's dream, and what the spirit of Sir Gawain told you this night, yet God of his great goodness hath preserved you hitherto. Therefore, for God's sake, my lord, leave off by this. For blessed be God, ye have won the field, for here we be three on live, and with Sir Mordred is none on live. And if ye leave off now, this wicked day of destiny is past. Tide me death, betide me life, said the king. Now I see him yonder alone. He shall never escape mine hands, for at a better avail shall I never have him. God speed you well, said Sir Bedivere. Then the king gat his spear in both his hands, and ran toward Sir Mordred, crying, Traitor, now is thy death day come. And when Sir Mordred heard Sir Arthur, he ran until him with his sword drawn in his hand. And then King Arthur smote Sir Mordred under the shield, with a foin of his spear throughout the body more than a fathom. And when Sir Mordred felt that he had his death's wound, he thrust himself with the might that he had 
up to the butt of King Arthur's spear, and right so he smote his father Arthur with his sword holden in both his hands, on the side of the head, that the sword pierced the helmet and the brain-pan, and therewithal Sir Mordred fell stark dead to the earth, and the noble Arthur fell in a swoon to the earth, and there he swooned off times. That is a good piece of war correspondence, Clarence. You are a first-rate newspaper man. Well, is the king all right? Did he get well? Poor soul, no, he is dead. I was utterly stunned. It had not seemed to me that any wound could be mortal to him. And the queen, Clarence, she is a nun in Almsbury. What changes! In such a short while! It is inconceivable. What next, I wonder? I can tell you what next. Well? Stake our lives and stand by them. What do you mean by that? The church is master now. The interdict included you with Mordred. It is not to be removed while you remain alive. The clans are gathering. The church has gathered all the knights that are left alive, and as soon as you are discovered we shall have business on our hands. Stuff! With our deadly scientific war material, with our hosts of trained, save your breath, we haven't sixty faithful left. What are you saying? Our schools, our colleges, our vast workshops, our— When those knights come, those establishments will empty themselves and go over to the enemy. Did you think you had educated the superstition out of those people? I certainly did think it. Well, then you may unthink it. They stood every strain easily until the interdict— since then they merely put on a bold outside at heart they are quaking make up your mind to it when the armies come the mask will fall it's hard news we are lost they will turn our own science against us no they won't why because i and a handful of the faithful have blocked that game i'll tell you what i've done and what moved me to it smart as you are the church was smarter it was the church that sent you cruising through her servants the doctors Clarence, it is the truth, I know it. Every officer of your ship was the church's picked servant, and so was every man of the crew. Oh, come! It is just as I tell you. I did not find out these things at once, but I found them out finally. Did you send me verbal information by the commander of the ship, to the effect that upon his return to you, with supplies, you were going to leave Cadiz? Cadiz? I haven't been at Cadiz at all. Going to leave Cadiz and cruise in distant seas indefinitely for the health of your family? Did you send me that word? Of course not. I would have written, wouldn't I? Naturally. I was troubled and suspicious. When the commander sailed again I managed to ship a spy with him. I have never heard of vessel or spy since. I gave myself two weeks to hear from you in. Then I resolved to send a ship to Cadiz. There was a reason why I didn't. Why was that? Our navy had suddenly and mysteriously disappeared. Also as suddenly and as mysteriously the railway and telegraph and telephone service ceased, the men all deserted, poles were cut down, the church laid a ban upon the electric light. I had to be up and doing and straight off. Your life was safe. Nobody in these kingdoms but Merlin would venture to touch such a magician as you without ten thousand men at his back. I had nothing to think of but how to put preparations in the best trim against your coming. I felt safe myself. Nobody would be anxious to touch a pet of yours. So this is what I did. From our various works I selected all the men, boys, I mean, whose faithfulness under whatsoever pressure I could swear to, and I called them together secretly and gave them their instructions. There are fifty-two of them, none younger than fourteen, and none above seventeen years old. Why did you select boys? because all the others were born in an atmosphere of superstition and reared in it. It is in their blood and bones. We imagined we had educated it out of them. They thought so, too. The interdict woke them up like a thunderclap. It revealed them to themselves, and it revealed them to me, too. With boys it was different. Such as have been under our training from seven to ten years have had no acquaintance with the Church's terrors, and it was among these that I found my fifty-two. As a next move I paid a private visit to that old cave of Merlin's, not the small one, the big one. Yes, the one where we secretly established our first great electric plant when I was projecting a miracle. Just so. And as that miracle hadn't become necessary then, I thought it might be a good idea to utilize the plant now. I've provisioned the cave for a siege. A good idea, a first-rate idea. I think so. I placed four of my boys there as a guard, inside and out of sight. 
nobody was to be hurt while outside but any attempt to enter well we said just let anybody try it then i went out into the hills and uncovered and cut the secret wires which connected your bedroom with the wires that go to the dynamite deposits under all our vast factories mills workshops magazines etc and about midnight i and my boys turned out and connected that wire with the cave and nobody but you and i suspects where the other end of it goes to we laid it underground of course and it was all finished in a couple of hours or so we shan't have to leave our fortress now when we want to blow up our civilization it was the right move and the natural one military necessity in the changed condition of things well what changes have come we expected to be besieged in the palace some time or other but however go on next we built a wire fence wire fence yes you dropped the hint of it yourself two or three years ago oh i remember the time the church tried her strength against us the first time and presently thought it wise to wait for a hopefuler season well how have you arranged the fence i start twelve immensely strong wires naked not insulated from a big dynamo in the cave dynamo with no brushes except a positive and a negative one yes that's right the wires go out from the cave and fence in a circle of level ground a hundred yards in diameter they make twelve independent fences ten feet apart that is to say twelve circles within circles and their ends come into the cave again right go on the fences are fastened to heavy oaken posts only three feet apart and these posts are sunk five feet in the ground that is good and strong yes the wires have no ground connection outside the cave they go out from the positive brush of the dynamo there is a ground connection through the negative brush the other ends of the wire return to the cave and each is grounded independently no no that won't do why it's too expensive uses up force for nothing you don't want any ground connection except the one through the negative brush the other end of every wire must be brought back into the cave and fastened independently and without any ground connection now then observe the economy of it a cavalry charge hurls itself against the fence you are using no power you are spending no money for there is only one ground connection till those horses come against the wire the moment they touch it they form a connection with a negative brush through the ground and drop dead don't you see you are using no energy until it is needed your lightning is there and ready like the load in a gun but it isn't costing you a cent till you touch it off oh yes the single ground connection of course i don't know how i overlooked that it's not only cheaper but it's more effectual than the other way for if wires break or get tangled no harm is done no especially if we have a tell-tale in the cave and disconnect the broken wire well go on the gatlings yes that's arranged in the center of the inner circle on a spacious platform six feet high i've grouped a battery of thirteen gatling guns and provided plenty of ammunition that's it they command every approach and when the church's knights arrive there's going to be music the uh, brow of the precipice over the cave i've got a wire fence there and a gatling they won't drop any rocks down on us well and the glass cylinder dynamite torpedoes that's attended to it's the prettiest garden that was ever planted it's a belt forty feet wide and goes around the outer fence distance between it and the fence one hundred yards kind of neutral ground that space is there isn't a single square yard of that whole belt but is equipped with a torpedo we laid them on the surface of the ground and sprinkled a layer of sand over them it's an innocent-looking garden but you let a man start in to hoe it once and you'll see you tested the torpedoes well i was going to but but what why it's an immense oversight not to apply a test yes i know but they're all right i laid a few in the public road beyond our lines and they've been tested oh that alters the case who did it a church committee how kind yes they came to command us to make submission you see they didn't really come to test the torpedoes that was merely an incident did the committee make a report yes they made one you could have heard it a mile unanimous that was the nature of it after that i put up some signs for the protection of future committees and we've had no intruders since clarence you've done a world of work and done it perfectly we had plenty of time for it there wasn't any occasion for hurry we sat silent a while thinking then my mind was made up and i said yes everything is ready everything is shipshape 
no detail is wanting i know what to do now so do i sit down and wait no sir rise up and strike do you mean it yes indeed the defensive isn't in my line and the offensive is that is when i hold a fair hand two-thirds as good a hand as the enemy oh yes we'll rise up and strike uh, that's our game a hundred to one you are right when does the performance begin now we'll proclaim the republic well that will precipitate things sure enough it will make them buzz i tell you england will be a hornet's nest before noon to-morrow if the church's hand hasn't lost its cunning and we know it hasn't now you write and i'll dictate thus proclamation be it known unto all whereas the king having died and left no heir it becomes my duty to continue the executive authority vested in me until a government shall have been created and set in motion the monarchy has lapsed it no longer exists by consequence all political power has reverted to its original source the people of the nation with the monarchy its several adjuncts died also wherefore there is no longer a nobility no longer a privileged class no longer an established church all men are become exactly equal they are upon one common level and religion is free a republic is hereby proclaimed as being the natural estate of a nation when other authority has ceased it is the duty of the british people to meet together immediately and by their votes elect representatives and deliver into their hands the government i signed it the boss and dated it from merlin's cave clarence said why that tells where we are and invites them to call right away that is the idea we strike by the proclamation then it's their innings now have the thing set up and printed and posted right off that is give the order then if you got a couple of bicycles handy at the foot of the hill ho for merlin's cave i shall be ready in ten minutes what a cyclone there is going to be to-morrow when this piece of paper gets to work it's a pleasant old palace this is i wonder if we shall ever again but never mind about that end of chapter forty two